this is true even of something like fish, which are one of those groups that we know relatively well. And what we see here are three different uh, lines. The ones in that bluish type of color are proposed new species over time. How many of them? The actually valid species that have been accepted. In the old days, they were exaggerating a little bit. And how many people have worked on fishes? So what's interesting is there are actually more people that are working on that group right now. But over the last 10 years or so, the rate of species discovery, even for something as well known as fish, has actually gone up from 600 to 800. So if we can find that many more species just for a group that's as well known as fish, can you imagine how many more there are out there of the other? This wonderful little beast, which is the size of a pinhead, is an animal that lives without oxygen. Until the 1980s, that was unheard of. How can an animal live without oxygen? Well, these loriciferans actually can. They're very, very small, and they live in the mud in the deep sea. Three new species were discovered, but this is an old, uh, a squid that's seven meters in length, new to science, found below a thousand meters, called the big fin squid. <clears throat> now, in terms of species discoveries for the census, we are finding quite a few species into, in various various groups. Crustaceans, however, are the ones where most of the new species are being found, mollusks, etc., etc. So you see the list here. So it's, it's pretty much an across-the-board thing is what I'm trying to get across here. Finally, you saw that in the video, barcoding. Barcoding is, is really uh, something that happened over the last 20 years or so and is sort of the next big thing in terms of understanding what species are out there and how evolution works because it's based on genetic information, not on morphological information, which is what Lou and I do. We look at things, we compare them, and say, yeah, that's very different from that. But there are many ways that species are found to look alike, but they're actually genetically different. Uh, camouflage is one of those things. And uh, doing this genetic work will help us to better understand just what there is of natural geography in shore areas. And as that applies, it talks about biodiversity near shore, in other words, where the land meets the sea. We wanted to create a baseline information, just like the census overall project wanted to do. We wanted to understand the species ranges, distribution of habitats, and we wanted to do that in terms of trying to understand what patterns there are in terms of the near shore diversity. Are there any hotspots? Where is the highest biodiversity? And what is it that really drives what you find in a certain place? What are the factors that determine what lives where. And the other one, of course, is try to educate the stakeholders' outreach programs, in other words. How do you do something like that? It was very interesting. Um, you basically divided the world up into eight regions as by the different colors that you see here. And uh, so central offices for each one of these were established. And these two guys here were doing the Atlantic Ocean, which is a pretty big swath of ocean. Of course, you can't do that with justice. But one of the interesting facts is that we actually managed to do some field work even as far away as Senegal in Africa. Basically, you have to be able to compare apples with apples when you look at different places. So it had a standardized protocol. That's what that means. It covered pretty much most of the habitats in terms of gradients from polar to tropical regions. It was actually over seven years rather than 10 years, which is a little longer to get going. In the Atlantic region, the one that you see actually, we actually got going in 2007. We were the last one invited to join. Uh, but we did our share. So to do that, we looked at two different habitats, the rocky shore, which you get lots of around here, and south bottom ones, uh, that's seagrass habitat, which is not that much around here, but in many other regions of the world. Together, these are the two primary habitats. And this is all in very shallow areas, so we're basically talking about the intertidal from the highest part down to the more than 15 meters. So it's pretty shallow water. And if you look at species, how many of them, and also their weight. And if you are interested, there was actually a rather interesting uh, documentary done by the CDC Humanity on the Nisa program that's still available on the web. If you
get people from different world part of the world together, you know, they, they, they don't know what you're doing, you don't know what they're doing. You have to have really a way of saying, okay, this is how we're going to do this. And that's, that's what this was. It was actually a book that was published that basically told us how we're going to do this. So that there are actually some really amazing flowcharts that tell you this is what you do first, this is what you do second. So it's, it's a cookbook. Very, very important. Almost 300 sites worldwide. And you can see them there in the different colors. Uh, the green just means this were the rocky hard substrate sites, and the red ones were the seagrass sites, and there were a few others that didn't fall into that category. And you can see they're you know, certainly not covering the globe, but um, we were in many parts of the world. And considering that we only started in 2007, I'm actually very proud to say that we did all that stuff that you see up there on the map through collaborations with many different organizations including the Department of Fisheries and Oceans here. Peter Walken was very instrumental in helping us in doing that. Uh, University of New Brunswick, uh, Acadia University, uh, and Suffolk University in the US was also very helpful. So this is why we had all these sites south of the border here, because in terms of the animals, they don't care whether this is Canada or the US. Three different quadrats, and you basically put them out on a transect line, as you show. See here, this looks like very similar habitat. You know what that looks like. But, uh, what's interesting is, so the information that was gathered on that was actually also included in another project that is ongoing still, which is known as the Biodiversity Corridor. So here we are in St. Andrews, and there's this swath of ocean that goes right into the deep sea from the very near shore that is basically where scientists are working together to understand all these different habitats better. So um, the Giza project was able to contribute to the near shore component of that. Just a few statistics that shows that even this smaller than the census project was still quite amazing in terms of its magnitude. So if you collected well over a million specimens, 231 field trips, 297 sites, you saw that already spread over 28 different countries. There were many different theses produced, outreach products, publications, over 200. This was done with $6.7 million. 2.8 came from the Sloan Foundation out of the 75 million that they had. Uh, but we were able to get 3.9 million with, with that core funding, which always shows you if you have some core funding, you can really leverage those funds to get other partners to come in. That sounds like a lot of money, but actually what it means is only about $100,000 available to each node per year. So the Atlantic, Atlantic, we did the Atlantic Ocean with $100,000. Fine. Well, are interested in. Uh, the Golden Meat Cup was the one that you mentioned before. Um, what's interesting, we actually rediscovered a species that was thought to be extinct, but this was a mollusk, not like the shrimp that was shown in the video elsewhere in the world. We also found many, many extensions of ranges in terms of species, and the same for habitats. So, where you didn't think something existed before, we now know it does. Spots were found in a number of regions of the world, can't say that we have one here, um, but that's also only for talking from a species point of view, so just from any species. And what this also shows is that it really depends on what group you're talking about. So crabs, for example, uh, if there's a hot spot in, in the, in the uh, Western Pacific, but not for snails, uh, which are a hot spot over in Alaska. So again, it really depends on what you're talking about when you talk about hotspots. You can just generalize. It drives the distribution of animals depends very much on what kind of animal it is. Is it a worm? Is it a crab? Is it a snail? And they react to things differently. So obviously, seaweeds are rather sensitive to light. So this is why the photo part, photo period. So they need a certain amount of light. So uh, their distribution depends a lot on that. Uh, for, for others, this is a natural thing, of course. Then we have the man-made stuff, listing all the different things here, whether it's shipping uh, increases, invasive species, you know, uh, pollution of various kinds. Again, uh, different animals, like worms, react differently than crabs do. So again, you, you can't really generalize in these types of things. Nature is a complex the other thing that Nagisa did, of course, is really reach out. And I think to me that was one of the most rewarding things that we did. Um, 
This included running taxonomic workshops. Uh, in Japan, they were really hot to trot on that, um, where people actually participated in the very process. You can't do that with some things. You can't do it with others. But it was great to see the public involved. And what, what it really does is that we, we, we get a sense of ownership of this place. And I really saw that when I was in Senegal, because there were some kids on the beach, and they wanted to know what the hell we were doing out there. And once we showed them what we were doing, they were just absolutely fascinated. They had no idea all this stuff was out there. I guarantee you, those kids are going to care about the oceans, but the legacies, of course, we have the standardized sampling protocols that allow us to get data that are comparable. We obtain the baseline that we now can use to assess things. <coughs> we provided all these data to OBIS, so they're readily accessible. And really, to me, the most important thing that the census did overall, and ESA followed that model, is that it showed on how we can work together to uh, uh, do something as large scale as this project was. I have to honestly say I was very skeptical when I got onto this. Uh, but uh, it can be done. I guess this is what my lesson learned from this was. It certainly wasn't perfect. There's lots more to do. But I think this is the model of how we need to do it. And some of these activities continue beyond 2010. Uh, there's some work going on at Musquash right now, actually, that's based on the ESA protocol. We moved a little bit more from the unknown to the known, I guess is the way I would put it. But there's a lot of stuff that we don't know about. There are a lot of near shore areas we never got to go to. We don't really fully understand the large scale patterns, which is what we need to do if we want to understand the changes that are happening in the world. And we need to better understand how things change in terms of time and how much of that is natural and not natural. But overall, it was a great big, very recent study. And it's interesting because it changed what you've just seen in terms of the census, which finished in 2010. This paper came out. 2011, just a year after, and has already recalibrated our understanding. So, just how many species are there in the world? Right now, or up to 2010, the best guesstimate was a million and a quarter, roughly. We know there are several fact, there are thousands of species that have been collected but not described, so that's probably a little bit low. But we're talking with thousands. It's not going to be that much higher. And underneath that, you see the line on what we think is the number or the range in terms of species on Earth. Now, let's pause here for a minute. Imagine a friendly alien would come and visit Earth. And his mission was to go to different planets and do a census on how many species there are. So he talks to the experts on biodiversity, and, and he says, well, tell me now, how many different life forms do you have on this planet? Silence. A smart scientist would probably say something like, define life forms. <laughs> but, you know, joking aside, you know, the guy would probably say, well, is it one million? Is it 10 million? Is it 100 million? The truth is, we don't really know. That's where things were at a year ago. In terms of marine species estimates, you remember that census was touting all these great statistics on what it had done. It came up with about 230,000, roughly a quarter million described, and at least a million marine species total. So for every known one, there's somewhere around three to four unknown ones. That's, remember he said that in the video. 